All right. Welcome, everybody. My name is Dan Kramer. I'm a trial lawyer. I handle plaintiff personal injury and employment matters here in Los Angeles at Kramer Trial Lawyers. We are in for a treat. Um, these are two of the most entertaining and talented attorneys, I think, in the state of California. Um, I look up to these guys, looked up to these guys my whole career and really excited that they jumped on and agreed to do this very important program. Now that courtrooms are opening up and trials are opening up, I think it's important to get these two perspectives from these fabulous attorneys on what things are going to look like in the courtroom. Um, so let me just do some quick intros. Uh, we have Gary Dordick. He's going to represent the plaintiff when we're discussing uh, post-COVID jury selection. Gary is probably one of the top trial attorneys in the state on the plaintiff's side. He's hit for $125 million, $50 million. The list can go on and on on his website. Cala Trial Lawyer of the Year, all sorts of awards. Um, but most importantly, I think, is that he's willing to give back to younger attorneys I don't know if you remember, Gary, but I had my uh, really early in my plaintiff's career. You offered to meet with me for lunch, took the time. We're not trying to take the case at all, but just gave me an opportunity to meet with you, go over my case. It's my first million dollar result. So I really do appreciate you taking that time. And he always does that to younger plaintiff trial lawyers. And, uh, you know, it's a real testament to you. Um, next up, we have Mike Schoenbach, real good buddy of mine. I was uh, fortunate when I was on the defense side, my first four years of my career, he was a mentor to me. Just an amazing uh, trial attorney. Tried almost over. Is it over 150 cases now, Mike? Or did you get? Uh, did you not hit that because of COVID? No, no, not over. I'm not at 100 yet. Getting. Oh, I thought almost. you were. Not right. almost. You'll be there. Almost. No, but he. Uh, I mean, he's kind of the bet your company uh, defense attorney here at uh, Daniel's Fine Israel and Schoenbach in Lebowitz. I think I got that right. Um, but uh, he represents. You know, when when other attorneys screw up the case on the defense side, the big carriers bring him in to handle it and hope to mitigate the damages. Um, very excited to have both of these guys here to talk about uh, what jury selection is gonna look like in a post COVID world. Um, so let's start just a little bit of some updates on the courts. Um, this is sort of for both of you, you know, courts are lifting restrictions. Different jurisdictions have different rules. Um, Gary, you're about to start trial in L.A. tomorrow. Is that right? Well, yes. Thanks for uh, the introduction. Thanks for having me. The introduction certainly probably overpromised. We're gonna we're gonna be a, a lunchtime treat. I certainly hope so. But uh, I remember uh, meeting you. I met you at my office away from my office, which uh, Beverly Hills Bar Association probably knows. I I go to factors for lunch like three times a week because it's walking distance and I meet with young lawyers there all the time and I'm happy to give advice and happy to help. I think it's our obligation to, to do that and I like to do it. Um, and congratulations. Uh, nowadays, people say, oh, you got a million dollars. Like it's nothing. No, it's really something. And it, it's it's still rare and it's a, it's a great thing. So happy to help. Uh, yeah, I'm starting trial tomorrow. My office is in trial on a case where we picked a jury uh, Friday and Monday. It's a case I couldn't try because the one I'm starting tomorrow is a priority trial that I have to do. But um, times, they are a changing. We, uh, uh, like Mike, I'm in trial all the time. I was in trial in March of 2020 when everything was coming crumbling down around us. You know, it was kind of like, like you're in the building during an earthquake. I, we were in there, we were in trial. It was the second retrial for this case because the first one got shut down for something. We started up, we were in the second week of jury selection in front of, if you know, Judge McLaughlin. And uh, uh, every courtroom was closing. Everybody was not coming in. They were closing one at a time. And we were the last trial going in LA Superior Court and McLaughlin's a tough old bird. He's like, we're not shutting down. And uh, we did our best. And then I think the governor ordered us to shut down. So that was March. March till now, I did some Zoom trials, but this will be the longest I've ever gone in 34 years without a jury trial. I, sometimes I average 13, 14 a year in the old days when Mike and I would try a case in three days. Now, maybe I do four to six a year or seven because they last a month or so. But yeah, I've got a, a bit of the shakes and the withdrawals. So I'm kind of excited. LASC tomorrow, 
Uh, it's a priority case. It's an auto case uh, trying against uh, Keith Bremer. I'll post on my Instagram where we get if you guys want to watch it. So what we can expect, what we saw on Friday. Well, let, let's go step by step, I suppose. You asked me about the different uh, jurisdictions, I think. Uh, the answer is you've come to us for knowledge. Here's the answer. Uh, hard to tell. I don't know. Everybody's just doing something different. Fortunately, a week ago, Monday, they lifted the mandatory distancing, which made a huge difference. I mean, nobody, they had, I think, 11 courtrooms in LA that could handle picking a jury six feet apart. And it was a disaster. Jurors were all around the courtroom and everyone hated it. That stopped. They're now uh, can use every courtroom. So I'm getting phone calls all day long. People are saying, should I take this week, Horn in Santa Monica, should I take this judge in Alameda? So all of them are open. All courts are, are free uh, to, to do trials. The only thing is we're still wearing masks. Now, the masks are irritating all of us, but I was going to take a writ because I don't want to try my case with witnesses and lawyers wearing masks. I researched it. My appellate lawyer and I looked into it, and we thought we might win until this Delta virus now is starting to take over and become a significant problem. So I probably won't file the writ because the reasons given previously for mandating masks in, in terms of the confrontation clause are probably, they weren't applicable, I don't think, maybe a month ago, but now they probably are. So masks are mandatory. It's up to the judge whether they let the witnesses take the masks off when testifying. Most of them have plexiglass and will do that. Lawyers keep their masks on. I'm told, I think starting this week, Riverside and maybe San Bernardino, uh, I heard they dropped the mask requirement. And uh, I'm not sure about San Diego. Maybe uh, Mike knows some more, but basically figure masks on and uh, social distancing off. And, be, and before we jump to how we actually pick a jury with a mask on, a good jury, Mike, what are you hearing in terms of different jurisdictions, different setups? I know it, Mike just finished his reign, as, his longest reign ever as a, a BOTA president, year and a half. So he, yeah. he's in the know. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate it. First of all, thank you very much for that, for that introduction. I appreciate everybody having me here. Um, Dan, I don't know if you remember, but you and I met when you were a young lawyer and you were a student of mine at the Aboda Trial School. We were in downtown LA and uh, yeah. we were doing jury selection, everything. And I could just tell that you, uh, you stood out from the crowd. So um, anyway, uh, thanks for having me here. Yeah, look, here's what's going on. There's a lot of uh, a backlog in LA and that due to the size of the, the court, the fact that it's the largest court system in the country and the largest court system in the world, the Los Angeles Superior Court, I've been told that there's between 50 and 60,000 cases backlogged in the personal injury hub. And therefore, even though the courts are starting to open up and trials are starting to happen, with that enormous backlog, I think it's going to be quite some time in LA before we're up and running at full speed. I think the other courts that are out there, Riverside, Orange County, San Bernardino, San Diego, I think they're going to be ahead of us in getting cases out to trial. A lot of those courthouses have bigger courtrooms. A lot of those courthouses have, uh, all of them have much less in terms of backlog, uh, way less cases than, than crowded LA. So um, I think, and also the restrictions are different. Um, I think that the Riverside court system has been lifting restrictions much quicker than a lot of the other uh, courthouses. My next two trials, uh, my next one is against Gary in LA. So we'll see what happens with uh, his case tomorrow. And then the one after that I have against Panache Shea and Boyle a couple of weeks, two weeks later, and that one's in Riverside. So I've been told that the one in Riverside is going to go. And I've been told that we are going to be maskless and able to do what we got to do. So that's my view. Yeah, I, I'll just say this. I was uh, I'm starting trial in two weeks um, PI case in Judge Mooney's courtroom and the defense attorney needed a three day continuance just to go watch his son in a tournament. And Judge Mooney shut it down. He said, no, that's going to screw up everything. There's so much backlog that I'll give you one day, but you're going to have to go in, in two weeks because otherwise it'll just, you know, the domino effect with all the backlog. So judges are sticking to it. It's great. You know, if we want to get to trial, which I do, it's a great thing for us out there. 
Dan, is yours a priority case or not no, a priority? It's not. It's not even a five year case either. Um, Judge Mooney, it, it just it got kicked to an independent calendar courtroom because of a bunch of motions a year ago. And he's just sticking to it. What I'm finding with LA, which is where obviously a lot of our cases are, we have three trials going this week uh, to our 36 uh, D priorities. And those for sure are going. And then the one is a long cause. The long cause judges manage their calendars and they're not moving it for anything else. Um, if you're at an independent judge assignment like you are, they're also pretty good about if you're set, they're going. They have finally, after 16, 18 months, whatever it's been, LA has realized this, let's continue every case just because somebody sneezes or blinks or wants a continuance is not working and it's creating problems. So it is a bit harder now to get a continuance in LA unless you have supposedly what, what is the old standard, the real standard, good cause. That said though, if it's not a priority case, it's not set with an independent judge and it's not long cause, they still are continuing them because of the backlog. Right. All right. So, so that's a good update on where we are. Now I want to talk more substantively about how we're going to pick a jury. And from both your perspectives, obviously, you know, so much of what we deal with when you're trying to learn, are these jurors going to be good for our case or not, is nonverbal communication, smiles, frowns, you know, whatever you get with a mask on in L.A., um, I'll start with you, Mike. How are you going to uh, how are you approaching this? How are you addressing it? Yeah, I think it's a really big issue. I mean, it, it is, it's, in my view, selection of the jury is probably the most important part of the case because not only are you picking the people that are going to ultimately give you your result, but it's your introduction. And first impressions are important. It's the first time you're addressing them, the first time you're speaking to them. So to me, it's a big issue. I think that, you know, you have to keep in mind when you're picking a jury, forgetting masks before COVID and all that, one of the most important things to do is always ask open-ended questions and get the jurors to speak. A lot of lawyers make the mistake of asking questions like cross-examination that give answers like yes and no and okay and things like that. And I think it's very important that uh, before COVID, you have to focus on getting the jurors to speak and getting them to open up. So you have to ask these really broad, wide open questions that result in conversation back and forth. Now put masks into the situation. I think it's even more important now to get them to speak. If you're gonna be questioning potential jurors with masks on and you're getting yes and no responses or you're getting nods of the head or okay or things like that, you're gonna learn absolutely zero. You're gonna learn less than zero. So I think now with masks, it is extremely important to follow the standard rule of getting them to speak. And I think the more you get them to speak and the more you listen and really pay attention to what they're saying, the more it would and hopefully make up for the fact that you can't see every single expression. I think the other thing you're going to have to do is I think people are going to have to focus on if we're going to be stuck where, with the mask, we're going to have to focus on reading eyes. It's much more difficult than reading someone's entire face. But think about this. When someone's wearing a mask, you can still identify who that person is almost every time. It could be some, you can always, it doesn't block their identity. So therefore, there is a lot to be read from only seeing that portion of a person's face. And, you know, the eyes, all the different expressions, the eyes, the windows of the soul and all these different there is a lot to be read. It's, it, it is like having one arm tied behind your back, but I think the combination of really focusing on people's eyes and getting them to actually speak and being very, very careful in your questioning to make sure you're getting open-ended conversation and discussion is about the best we're gonna do. What do you think, Gary? Well, now that I realize I'm trying a case against Mike in two weeks, I'm actually not gonna say anything today. <laughs> you know, he was going to be stealing all my good stuff and using it against me. But, you know, look, I mean, I, uh, I have my handy dandy mask here. I mean, Mike, are you looking into my eyes? Are you beating <laughs> me all right? I mean, what the heck, man? Can't see, can't see nothing. In fact, it's fogging up my glasses. I, I have to, I mean, I guess I can be very, like when, when his witness says nonsense, I'll be like, 
<laughs> and, you know, I guess we can use our heads, right? We'll be like, tell me more. Oh, but man, this really is crap. And, um, you know, it just, uh, my associate, I told you, was picking the jury on Friday in L.A. Uh, in front of Judge Deason. One of the jurors complained to the judge that one of the defense lawyers had the mask under his nose. So, I mean, there's a tendency to do that, particularly when it keeps fogging up your glasses and they've actually complained. You're like, OK, dude, you just lost that one. <laughs> that, that juror already hates you. Um, so in terms of uh, uh, reading people with masks. Yeah, I mean, it's like Mike said, let me start preliminary preliminarily by emphasizing we're talking today, general COVID kind of principles, general things we've learned and, you know, most of us don't have a lot of experience. We got Mike and I, I know we did some COVID trials and we did some COVID mock trial jury picking here, but actual trying cases in a post COVID time, there's not a lot of uh, knowledge uh, experience, but I'll tell you this, I did several seminars on COVID jury selection over the last year. On one of them, I did research um, of all the jury results. And I think we're going to talk about that in some questions later. But I also want to just make clear, we're giving you general um, concepts that we think will be helpful. But remember, your case, your facts, your client, your jurisdiction, your judge, all has to be evaluated. We're just throwing out there stuff for you to think about. Don't uh, substitute what we're telling you what we think works for your own instincts when you're there in trial. I see uh, questions coming up. Can you wear uh, your own masks with designs? When I, I started trial last month in Tulare County and the judge was just killing me. He, didn't, he wanted me to settle. I wouldn't settle. He was giving me a hard time and really sour, stern the whole time. So I just said, said any more questions? I said, just one last question, Your Honor, just before we go. He says, okay, what is it? I said, I'm gonna put plaintiff verdict printed on my mask. Is that okay with you, judge? And he's like, whoa, I guess we'll see a motion in limine on that, won't we, counsel? Ho, 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 ho. But I don't know. I, I think you could wear a, you know, a paisley mask to match your suit if you want. I'm going to probably stick generic because they're, the advice I can give you from wearing masks in a courtroom during the trial I did up in Tulare, it did settle. Uh, lightweight, thin, and comfortable are better. I got some really cool ones when we were going out trendy to the restaurants to match my, well, like my, my stylish evening black attire. And it, it, I got some really slick ones. Can't even breathe, breathe through the freaking thing. So I'm going to probably go with this one, maybe in white, but yeah, like Mike says, just do your best to read the whole person, the whole body, look at their clothes, look at how they're interacting with people. Like you'd always do look at their shoes, look at their attention to detail, look how they sit with people, look how concerned they appear to be. How do they wear their mask? What mask do they wear? How, do they lean in? Do they lean back? Mike says eyes. What about body language? Who here can award millions and millions of dollars? The arms fold, the body comes in. You're like, well, okay, I get it. Or, you know, you're, you're reading everything, not just the mouth, but let's face it. Smiles and frowns are easy things to read. Now you're reading a little more subtle tea leaves, but as, as Mike pointed out, listen more to the words coming out of their mouth and that'll probably tell you what you need to know. And I think it does, I think like Mike was saying, it does provide an opportunity just to address it. Look folks, typically we get to see your faces and so much of what we read in jurors is nonverbal communication. I can't do that now. Can you guys then speak up? It's inviting them to speak up even a little bit more just to address, address it head on, I think. Well, um, I mean, you know, Dan, you, you talk about addressing COVID head on. Look, you have to address COVID right now head on. Mike and I are old enough where we've seen different things going on in the state and the uh, nation and the world during trial that comes in that we got to deal with. I remember when we first went to war in Iraq and young men were coming home and on the news, they'd show the coffins and they'd show young men being killed every day. And every day was dominating everything we read, everything we saw, everything we talked about, particularly the beginning of the Iraq war, which I guess was what, early 2000. And 
it was affecting us picking a jury. It was something you couldn't get around. You had to talk about their views, particularly on a death case. So now we're dealing with COVID and it affects everybody's life all day, every day, whether it's financially, emotionally, they're wearing masks, they're not doing what they want. So you need to voir dire on COVID. And I can share with you my thoughts about what that means, but in terms of addressing it, hey man, I believe, and I've lectured many times, when I pick a jury, I got a list of everything wrong with my case, everything I'm worried about. Tomorrow, my voir dire is gonna be, does anyone have a problem with the plaintiff testifying in Farsi? I'm concerned, I'm worried, she's from Iran. The mother needs an interpreter in Farsi and the daughter is gonna speak with a very thick accent. What do you think about Middle East, Farsi, Iran? I'm, I'm hitting it head on, I'm hitting everything I got a problem with. COVID is right up there at the top of my list. I'm going to be voir diring on it extensively. What are you trying to find? I mean, so you're going to find out, are you going to ask things like, do you think COVID is real or do you believe in vaccines? Are you going to go that detailed into their beliefs or are you going to kind of avoid that? Well, I like to say by a show of hands, raise your hand if you're vaccinated. <laughs> oh, sir, why the hell not? <laughs> you know, like, ah, you, you know, uh, but I don't think I, you can't ask anything that infringes on their privacy, but this is what I've learned. This might be the crux of what I have to say here today. I hate to use my good stuff so early in the hour, but what the heck. Um, so I did studies. I researched every verdict that came out. I gave this lecture several months ago, but I'd looked at every Zoom trial, the early trials that were going on in other states before California shut down before others. I looked at all of the trials that were done during COVID and what the results were. And I looked at some psychological studies that were done. A lot of the jury analysts and some government entity type think tanks did studies on people's views. And what you find, and it's probably no surprise, is if somebody was not concerned about COVID, if their view was this is just a democratic liberal bunch of nonsense, and I don't wanna wear a mask. The guy standing up in the grocery store saying, you can't make me wear a mask. In the restaurants in Orange County that refused to uh, shut down and had business as usual. Well, what do you think those folks would do on a jury? They would not give you any money. They would be very pro-defense jurors because Think about who is and has generally taken that view. Trumpers, hardline Republicans, people that don't want to give any kind of benefits. They don't want any services. They don't want any immigrants. That tended to be the philosophy of the people not believing in COVID and not believing in precautions. So what you saw from that was if you inquire is they were all defense-minded jurors and they gave terrible awards and they said they'd give terrible awards and polls. The liberal or more democratic or more, in my view, reasonable and rational-minded people, when those folks were asked, how concerned were you with COVID? Very concerned. And how much precautions did you take? And how much were you worried about loved ones getting sick? All of those people tended to be plaintiff oriented. And to a certain extent, the more concerned they were about COVID and having effects from COVID, and also very important, the more they suffered themselves in their lives, the more their loved ones suffered, the more they were hurt by COVID themselves financially or physically and emotionally, the higher damages they would award. And I think that's a very good I concept and general thing to keep in mind when you're picking a jury. But at the same time, you have to look at it that these are not static opinions or static times. COVID has been kind of waxing and waning and changing and so have attitudes. The folks that didn't want to wear, that, that, that wanted to wear a mask, that wanted the government shut down, that wanted us to be more careful. Maybe they got to the point where they're like, I'm tired of wearing this mask. California's got to open back up. We've got to open the restaurants. And then they maybe shifted their views. Views with jurors have also shifted a little bit. And what I mean by that is 
I follow the juries. I file, follow the trials. Early on when courts were opening up around the country, right? If you're going to look at April when some courts were back in business, those earlier courtrooms and jurisdictions that opened, what happened? Well, one, they were more conservative jurisdictions, more tended to be Republican controlled that opened, so lower verdicts. And then also think about it, who showed up to go in a uh, cattle call of people, of strangers into a building, a place you didn't wanna go anyway, and went there because you were told with a piece of paper and a summons from the government to go there and crowd in there and get breathed on by everybody. All the people that didn't believe in COVID, didn't want to wear a mask and didn't think it was any big deal. So what did they do? They gave bad verdicts, low verdicts. As we shift from April now into July, and we're shifting into a time where all of the courtrooms pretty much are open and restrictions are being reduced, who's showing up? Everybody's showing up. Many, many more people, many people that weren't showing up that you wanted, people with more friendly, more liberal attitudes. So the jury we saw on Friday, the juries that I was seeing back in Tulare a month or so ago, although Tulare ain't a good place, whether you're in COVID times or not for plaintiff lawyers, I'm sorry to say, um, but much better, much better. And we saw some huge, huge COVID verdicts by Zoom across the country, huge people. Well, I'll save that for later, but um, I'll save my thoughts about the jury verdicts. But in terms of if short takeaways, little things you can write down here at lunch and think about, take with you is the more they were hurt by COVID, the more they're affected by COVID, the more they believed in COVID, the more plaintiff jurors they probably are. Now I'll let like, my, yeah. my trials, I let Mike say one word and then we run out of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mike, I definitely want to hear your perspective on all that. It's exactly like being in trial with Gary. I never, I never get a shot. Um, anyway, you know what? Um, I agree with everything Gary says. I mean, it really, it's absolutely on point. You cannot be afraid to address, like he said, whatever the, the troubling issues are in your case, and you cannot be afraid to address whatever's going on out there in the world. You got to hit it head on. You got to find out at the beginning of trial, not six weeks later when you get your verdict, and then you talk to the jury afterwards and find out why you got crushed. You got to hit it head on and get the people to talk. Years and years ago, I went up to Fresno to try a first party bad faith case. I'll never forget this. I fly up on Sunday. I get set up in my hotel. I'm going to be representing this insurance company. I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do here. The first thing I did back then, this was before uh, phones and uh, iPhones and all that. I open up the phone book. I start reading about the local streets and everything and the restaurants and whatever, so I can make some references during voir dire. So I, I mean, it's bad enough. I'm going to stick out as it is in LA. Imagine what I look like in Fresno. So I try to, you know, get in there. So anyway, I turn the TV on after I finish reading the phone book and it was an advertisement for an upcoming movie, Danny DeVito in the firm. And he goes, there's nothing better than screwing an insurance company. That was the tagline for this movie that was coming out. And the next morning, I'm going to be picking a jury defending an insurance company. So you got to pay attention to what's going on out there. And you got to hit it head on with the voir dire question. So on COVID, you got to ask them. You got to ask them everything. What are you going to ask specifically, Mike? What yeah, are you well, like Gary says, you got to balance. You can't invade the privacy, but at the same time, you got to find out. You got to find out their position. So I say you ask them head on what their feelings are about COVID, about the shutdown, about work. Were they affected? How does that affect going to going to um, come into this trial? You know, work wise, money wise, things like that. You got to learn as much information as possible. Wearing masks, not wearing masks, you might as well. You're going to find out a lot about them. And if a judge stops you, then the judge stops you. But I think you have to at least ask as many questions as possible. So I would ask questions about um, about wearing masks. I would ask questions about um, what they did during COVID. You know, were they home? Were they working at home? Were they out of work? Were they fired? Were they let go? How do they feel going through the COVID experience would affect them, if at all? Uh, when sitting as a juror, how do you feel about, about, you know, uh, you, you've been, let's say someone's been out of work. Now you're sitting here and you have to come into 
uh, a trial and you heard it's going to take three weeks, four weeks. How do you feel about that? Are you, know, are you okay with that? Whatever, just get them talking about the subject. Uh, I think you got to ask him everything under the sun about COVID and learn as much as possible because it is what's going on now. Like Gary says, sometimes there's a war going on. Sometimes there's a George Floyd protest going on, whatever it is. Sometimes there's Danny DeVito screaming in your ear on a, on a freaking movie uh, thing, which was like the worst timing in the world. Uh, but it is what it is and you have to deal with it. So, well, so, so j- jump into the, the political environment. I mean, it seems like, at least in the media, that people are obviously more forthcoming since Trump, since Black Lives Matter protests, that people are more forthcoming with their beliefs. I think that could be a good if, if people are like the jurors are like that. I haven't tried a case in 18 months either. But if jurors now, given the political environment, would be willing to be more forthcoming. What, I mean, what do you think? You think that's are you going to address any of those things or try to avoid that completely? And let me just clarify, Mike, did you think you were going to fit in in Fresno? I was just uh, curious on that one. You- I, I, I will let you know that I actually, believe it or not, combed my hair to the side like an idiot thinking that was going to make a difference. And it made no difference at all. Did you tell him everybody sounds like you in Los Angeles? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, Absolutely. You know, the, the questions to ask, you know, when you're I plan on asking them. I would start, I think, with where they're at right now. I like to know who likes to be on the jury, who is happy being there, interested in being there. Jurors that are happy being there and interested in the case and interested in the legal system, or at least neutral, are are generally pretty fair, and I think even both sides. If they're pissed off and angry about being there for any reason, they're missing their vacation or they're missing work, um, those are tend to be bad jurors for both sides, I think, because they're going to rush to a decision and they're going to blame somebody and they're just not spending the time and attention to analyze the evidence in the law and come to a fair decision. So I always like to know how they feel about being there on that jury. And this time, of course, how I would ask them straight up, how do you feel in terms of COVID? with being here in this courtroom with everybody. And I, that's a good segue. Well, who's, who's concerned about it? Who's, would you say, is not very concerned at all? And then segue. You know, um, we've, we've, we've had uh, a tough uh, 18 months or so, and in some place, of course, it's, it's still a, a serious problem. Who, or I wouldn't, maybe I wouldn't say it's a serious problem because some don't agree, but you'd say, so who, who agrees that, COVID was a very, very serious problem. Well, who thinks maybe, you know what, that maybe it was a bit overrated, that maybe it was uh, the news media that inflated uh, the concern or the seriousness. Who, who thinks that? Well, sir, tell me about that. Tell me what you think when you say that really maybe, was it news media or what? I don't want, I didn't mean to suggest, I'd like to hear your thoughts. Bring it around the room because you want to know how it's going to affect them on this case and sitting there. Remember, sorry, the phone's ringing. Remember in, a, in pre-COVID when you were looking at a jury box and somebody sneezes in the jury box, just pre-COVID, everyone's kind of like, oh, no, guy's going to get me sick. He's going to get the whole room sick. Nowadays, you ever been in a restaurant or something where somebody sneezes? <laughs> like, I mean, they want to drag that person out. You know, they want to. The, so uh, I think people are going to be really sensitive and you, you really need to just ask the questions. I don't think the judge is going to be uh, too hard on you, although they may not understand necessarily why you're asking as many questions. Also, these judges, you know, they tend to limit our time picking a jury unreasonably. But to the extent they do, I don't think it's wrong to ask the judge to ask some COVID questions. You know, Your Honor, these are neutral questions. I don't, I don't like judge asking damages questions. It's like the old lines in the movies, judge. I don't mind you trying the case for me. Just don't lose it. Because when they ask, that was from what the verdict with Paul Newman, great movie. But when they ask damages questions, of course, like, well, you all can be fair. Okay, fine. So you want to for sure do those yourself. But on COVID, if the judge wants to start it off, you'll see how they react. You'll get some feedback and then you can take it from there. Yeah, I mean, I think the ju- a lot of these judges are learning too, just like us, because they haven't tried cases in 18 months as well. You had um, a question about, did you say politics or political? Well, I think you were kind of getting there with the news media, and I think that the, the COVID is a good starting place that will segue into politics, I guess. Mike, what do you think? Uh, about the connection between politics and COVID? I or did, just addressing politics. 
Yeah, I mean, well, you have to be very careful addressing politics because if you if you hit that head on, you're going to get uh, <laughs> you're going to get admonished by the court. So I think you have to figure out ways uh, to to get the answer to the question uh, without being so obvious. I've heard some lawyers uh, ask where a juror gets their news information from. Hey, where do you get your source of information from? And then the juror says, oh, I get mine strictly from Fox News. Well, it's obviously no great secret that majority of people that get their news from Fox probably have a more conservative leaning. So that was a way to to get. Now, I, I've also heard judges shut that line of questioning down. Um, so, you know, I've heard people ask, uh, you know, if, if anyone has bumper stickers on their car, what do those bumper stickers say? I mean, again, most people, not all, but most of you see those bumper stickers are more likely than not are going to be Democratic uh, people for some reason, peace signs and whatever. I don't know why that what, is. What if, it says in, what if it says impeach Biden? Yeah, but then exactly. But then you ask the follow up question. Exactly. What does the sticker say? Uh, and again, it might squeak out before you get admonished or not. But that's the way to hit it uh, subtly. And I agree with Gary's technique about uh, COVID. You can find out a lot about people's uh, political perspective by the way they react to COVID, how they feel about COVID and the way they handled it themselves personally. So I think that's a great way to learn information. I think the current political environment stuff doesn't apply to COVID other than what we've discussed in terms of hardline Republicans. But I do think in this post-Trump time that people may be more forthcoming with biases uh, that they wouldn't. In the old days, old days, you know, year pre-Trump, when I would say I represent a lot of people that don't speak English, often they speak Spanish or they come from Mexico or uh, places, uh, uh, other countries. And I would say, who has a problem with someone coming to this country that they speak Spanish and they don't speak English just by a show of hands? And generally, you don't get any hands because no one raises their hand saying, well, I'm really racist and bigoted. And I want to make sure everybody knows that. But what you see is I say they don't speak English. And the, the eyes there, you see their eyes roll, you see their eyebrows go up, you see them go like that, and you say, you pull it out. So I noticed a little bit of apprehension there, maybe, that you're concerned they don't speak English, you got to pull it out. Now I think people, there's a lot of people thinking it's okay to say, I don't trust people from the Middle East, or I don't uh, like people like this or that. I think we might get more people um, sharing views that uh, normally they wouldn't share in public. I think it's becoming maybe uh, more acceptable to have what I would consider fringe views. Yeah, you know, I, I think that the, what's happened in the world is I think that we've become more polarized. You know, and there's more running to the, to, the, to the fringe, like Gary says, and I agree with that. I think because people are more polarized now, you are more likely to get people speaking about these views. Yeah, I mean they're uh, they're less hesitant, that's for sure. But again, to get four cause challenges, that's a good thing for us. I think at least as plaintiff lawyers, um, four, four cause challenges I think are great for the whole process. Yeah, I mean you want to. I agree. No matter what side I'm handling on a jury trial, to getting the people who are not going to make good jurors off the jury by four cause challenge, I think is is good for everybody. When I see someone who's a lunatic in my mind, even if they're a lunatic in my favor. If the judge or plaintiff's counsel says, hey, can we get rid of this person? I'm going to go, of course, I'm not going to waste everybody's time on that. And I even volunteered and said, you know what, Your Honor, or hey, Gary, juror number nine is a lunatic. Let's get rid of that person, even if they're in my favor. You got to respect the process first. Yeah. Uh, we did that when Mike and I were in trial in Long Beach. We were stipulating to get rid of some real crazy jurors, just lunatics. And we knew right away this person's got some mental health challenges and they're just not fit even to be on a, a jury for either side. And the judge was kind of like taken back. We're like, Judge, we want to stipulate to get rid of this juror. Right. The judge is like, well, who's, whose challenge is this? Like, ain't hey, nobody's challenge. Yeah. You know, we're, 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 we're just agreeing. And she was kind of like ruffled by the fact yeah. that we were doing that, but eventually uh, she let us, agree. if you both agree, I guess it's okay. Yeah, but you have to, I think you have to do that. You don't want to waste everybody's time. You don't want something, someone saying something offensive uh, or, or whatever, just get them out of there. They're not going to be there. So why waste the time? So, but in the interest of saving time, are, are you pushing for more juror questionnaires now so that you, you and Mike 
or when, when you two are trying to case together, you have the jury questionnaires, you can just quickly like this person is obviously would be off for cause. Are you guys pushing for that more? I like questionnaires just because you learn. I personally think that, well, first of all, remember in a questionnaire, in my view, someone is going to be a little more likely to say something uh, that's extreme. It's easier to write down on a piece of paper. I hate whatever than it is to raise your hand in open court and say the equivalent of I hate whatever. So I do think you're going to learn more on the question. For some reason, they don't realize that they're going to be asked questions about the questionnaire. They think they're just going to write something down, submit it and get excused, which is what they might be trying to do. But I also so you expose the, the rats that way. But I also like questionnaires because you learn a lot of information uh, in a short period of time and it saves a lot of time in the in the court. So I do like questionnaires before COVID and especially now afterwards. Well, let me say this. Um, yes, I, I do like questionnaires, but it's not that simple for, for lawyers, I think. It's not really an all yes or all no. For example, most judges seem to hate them. Whenever you bring it up with a judge, their idea is every time I've done a questionnaire, it's delayed jury selection for two days and they seem to take longer. So I don't like questionnaires. That seems to be their canned response. In reality, they can save time. But I think you need to pick the case. If you've got an auto v. auto five day trial, simple kind of case, just simple trip and fall, just put on the case. Don't worry about it. If you have cases with um, molestations or you have, you know, uh, you have cases with psychiatric injuries. My case tomorrow has psychiatric injuries. And the truth is, it's hard to say to people by a show of hands, who has a therapist? Who's on antidepressants? It's unfair to put people in that position. So it takes a lot of time and care and you end up going into chambers often. So you can explain to the judge, we're really saving time by using these questionnaires. And the, then the judge will say, OK, I'm going to let you use one for just four questions about sexual uh, misconduct or about uh, whatever your issue is. But the reality is it takes about the same time. And so uh, Mike's right. You get a tremendous amount of information. They have a judicial counsel standard form questionnaire. Look at that questionnaire if you haven't done it. It's got good questions. And that questionnaire tells you good information that if you don't know it, ask those questions to the jury. Smart people put that questionnaire together and it has a lot of good information, but it'll tell you about their educational background and their employment backgrounds, and it has very good information. So you're gonna learn a lot. It's designed for you to add pages to it or questions to it unique to your case because the form is generic. So for whatever is unique to your case, work with the defense, stipulate to it, let the judge know you have it. Make sure you show up with enough copies. Make sure you show up with pencils for everyone to fill it out or pens, enough for everybody. And make sure you have it figured out how they're going to uh, photocopy them and distribute them and work out the details or the judge is going to tell you no. My last view on questionnaires is this. I've picked, and yes, uh, Michael, one day you will join me as a diplomat in Amoda, Aboda, over 100 trials. I'm approaching 150 now. And um, that much to go. That much to go. Yeah. Well, the thing is, I think from all these trials, I'm pretty good at reading jurors and I'm pretty good at getting information out of them. If I have a defense lawyer that's not that good and not that experienced, that questionnaire is helping him a whole lot more than it's helping me because I think I got a good idea just old school way. That lawyer is going to see stuff in the questionnaire like, oh, gee, you can almost pick a jury from those questionnaires because it's giving you so much information so easy that you have no skill in getting it out. But I'll also tell you this, everybody who goes through questionnaires, and I know you have a question about consultants coming up, we go through the questionnaires and Mike, you probably use one through five or something like that. That's what I do. Uh, one juror is terrible and five is good and you read through them and you write oh four plus or three plus or five or one or a zero and you got them all figured out a lot of times when you start asking questions you realize those numbers are way off you were really misreading something or you missed something so you can give some tentative numbers 
But so it's a complicated answer, but overall questionnaires are helpful. Most of the time, the judges don't like them. If you're going to use them, do it right in terms of the questionnaires and the logistics of it. And depends on the case and it depends on opposing counsel. You All right. Flexible. So let's just... You got to be, be flexible. Don't just stick with the questionnaire information. And Gary, I use a check, an X and a question mark. I will never accept an X. I will accept a certain number of question marks as long as I have enough checks to make sure I get an 8-4, not a 9-3, an 8-4. Yes, whoever's Jim. listening, I don't know <laughs> why he has a complicated system with only checks and X's and O's, but numbers or letters tend to be the norm, A, B, C, one, two, three. Yeah, so let's uh, just, just quickly, in the interest of time, on, on jury, jury consultants. Mike, do you use them? I don't use them a lot. I'm not saying not to use them. I don't use them a lot. I think you have to be very skilled to use a jury consultant because I feel that it is most important to make your connection with the jury. If you are able to use a consultant and not interfere with your relationship that you're developing with the jury, then great. But if your use of a jury consultant is going to interfere with your ability to commingle with these jurors, then you're making a mistake. I feel that I can do this very well. And I, I've watched Gary a number of times, one of the best I've ever seen. He just gets up and has a conversation with these jurors. By the time he's done with it, they all want to go to lunch with him. They all want to go hang out with him, whatever. You no, can't I, disrupt. I do have lunch with them. That's I know. <laughs> Before the trial's over. No, during, I yeah. I can't <laughs> um, stress how important it is not to disrupt that relationship. Because that, to me, is the most important thing. So if you can do it, if you can pick the jury, get that bond, have that communication where it's natural and you're not reading from a script and you're not turning your eyes away from them, paying attention to a jury consultant. Because think about it. When you go to a party somewhere, if you're talking to someone and their eyes are looking somewhere else, they're not listening to you and you're losing them. But you got to maintain that eye that eye uh, contact with these jurors and talk to them and actually listen to what they're saying. Don't just rattle off your, your pre, you know, pre-selected questions. Uh, it's an awful jury selection. You have to have a conversation, forget your questions, get up and talk to them and feed off of what they're saying and have a back and forth and then interact and have them talk to each other kind of by comparing their opinions. If you can do that and use a jury consultant, great. If the use of the jury consultant is going to pull your attention away from that conversation, then do not use the consultant. That's my view. Gary, what do you think? I would say on that, that number one, Mike probably doesn't use that many because the carriers say to him, why should I pay for a jury consultant when I'm paying you all that money? Come on. <laughs> um, but I would say that uh, depends on the case, depends on the lawyer, depends on a lot of things. But as a general rule, Jury consultants are a very helpful, and to some, to me, I think they might be a bit of a luxury because they provide me good information, but it costs money. But if you figure out what the cost is and you look at how much you're putting in, I can't try a case today for under hundred grand. By the time I get a couple experts, a couple exhibits, and some expert depots, I'm at a hundred. Some of these, I just tried a case. Uh, a Zoom three judge uh, trial recently uh, against U-Haul and my costs were $700,000 on just the liability phase. Fortunately, I won. So, but the, uh, the thing with jury consultants are if you're not that experienced, well, well let me go back. What well, Mike says 100% right, but that's why you have to be very careful how you use the jury consultant. Uh, I don't have them involved in my questions. I don't have them at the, my counsel table as a general rule, unless it's a case where I got a ton of people at the table anyway. I do my thing. And then at a break or something, before we do challenges, they say, hey, this is my thought. So I've picked 150 juries, right? I, I'm pretty good. I still make mistakes. I still miss things and I still lose like everybody who does this business. So I got another guy that's maybe picked, I say guy, there's men and women. Maybe this person's picked 500 juries. Maybe he's done a thousand juries. That's all he does, courtroom to courtroom. And that person tells me, I don't like that juror. And I say, I was on the fence. 
And he says, well, you know what? They did union work if you missed that. And their son was in an accident and didn't get compensated. I'd say you have two challenges left. I'd use it on that one. Or they say to you, I don't know enough about these three jurors. Ask these three more questions because I think you probably don't know and I don't know. And so I can spitball like I would with Mike. If we were picking a jury together, God forbid, I was on the defense. No, I'm going to bring you to the plaintiff. We could say, hey, what do you think? Two minds, let's say intelligent minds with experience picking jurors are still going to debate it. Now you have someone else to help you make good decisions. And if you're less experienced, you've picked three jurors or five jurors or no jurors or 10 jurors. This guy here can come in who's picked a thousand and been on a lot of big big cases and help you not make a major, major mistake. Uh, I know we're short on time. I'll just say this. My, my son, when he picked his first jury, he wasn't listening to me, brand new lawyer. I, he didn't. He was doing his own thing. He wanted to do his own thing. At night, he's telling me how the jury looks. I'm like, oh, you left that jury. Oh, yeah. He goes, oh, they were good. They were good. I'm like, I don't think so. He did not win his first trial, but he needed somebody with more experience uh, to let him know the error of his ways. So I know what, uh, the most important topic is probably less, uh, last, and we're, yeah. and that is um, our topic about post COVID verdicts, what we think they're going to look like, right? Yeah. You, hey, you're doing my job for me. Yeah. That's exactly. Uh, you gave me the cheat sheet. I know, man. I gave you the <laughs> script. Uh, yeah. So obviously, from you two, love to hear your predictions on what you think uh, it's going to look like. You know, damage verdicts are going to look like after COVID. Well, we're going to take we're going to take our case out of it, you know, because, you know, Mike sees his uh, success in that trial going well. And uh, I'm hoping mine, uh, it goes well for me. But I'll say this. I think that there's been some big verdicts post COVID. If you get a fair minded group, meaning no extremists on either side, I think the COVID times have taught our society, our state. Um, compassion and suffering and uh, the value of life and the value of health and emphasize the well-being, emphasize the importance of a job, emphasized what happens when these things are taken. And I think that the studies have shown we've seen more bigger verdicts and the jurors haven't been afraid to give away money. And I think if anything, when the balanced group of jurors come back to the courts, I expect to see higher verdicts right now. And I think the COVID reaction or COVID push should be higher verdicts. But with that, I would say be careful. Some people who were significantly affected and are hardened by it, people who suffered and got no money, people that are pissed off that COVID has kept them from work, and now you're keeping them from work longer on this jury, or they think you're wasting their time with this dumb case or saying your arguments two or three or four times, they might punish somebody and it could well be the plaintiff who they see is being responsible for them being there. So as a general answer, I think the studies, the statistics and the results so far show they tend to be higher verdicts, but there's some things you got to look out for with the individual jurors. Mike, what are your thoughts? I agree 100% on that. I really think that if you have the right case, and the right jurors, you'll be okay. But like Gary said, there's some issues out there. Think about the way that during COVID and even before COVID, but the way that the, the population is out there now on Twitter and Instagram and everybody fighting with each other. If someone says one thing, everybody jumps on them and, and beats them up and says, you know, ju- you know, sends in their comments and their criticisms. How dare you say that and everything. People are looking to, to call out uh, evil doers. They're looking for bad people. They're looking to punish people. It used to be in the old days. And when I talk about the old days, I'm not even talking pre-COVID. I'm talking like 90s. In the 90s, it was all sympathy. The whole world of verdicts revolved around sympathy. So we would have to voir dire sympathy enormously about how bad people feel about an injured person and this and that. That's no longer the case. The millennials and the new jurors out there In my view, with all due respect to everybody, they don't have a sympathetic bone in their body. They're just looking to beat up someone who did something bad. So you just have to find uh, the bad person and they want to jump on that person and call them out, punish them financially and and inflict pain. So to me, uh, it's going to depend on 
how the evidence is and how the case is set up. If the case is set up to expose one of the sides as being, let's say the defense is a bad person, an evil defendant. In this time now, mixed in with COVID, I think you're going to get very, very large verdicts. People are angry and I think they're looking to punish. So I think you have to be very, very careful. They were saying that statistically, when I looked at the studies, people are much more distrustful of the government now. They're much more distrustful of corporations now in this COVID time. So yeah, it's I guess what uh, Mike's talking about, talking a lot about is the reptile concepts are now uh, even more uh, relevant and important. Um, I see my friend Robert Kahn is texting, is asking a question if you can wear face masks in court. I'm told no. It would be nice, but I'm told that doesn't satisfy their mandate for a mask. You can wear I mean, a, uh, a shield or? Yeah, I'm saying a shield. Yeah. But I'm told that you're not allowed to. Yeah, just a good. So let's just run through a couple, couple quick questions. Uh, Edwin Pearson asked about mini openings. I love them. I swear by them. The judge is required to allow you to do it now. What do you guys think? Just be careful because a lot of people oversell their mini opening and then they expose their their jurors. So I just think that it's counterintuitive. But if you're going to do a mini opening, do not go in there and try to win your case, because if you do remember, it's before voir dire. Opening statement is after voir dire. They're already there. That's when you try to win. If you do it before and you've won your case in mini opening, guess what? I'm going to ding every single one of the jurors that's going along with your mini opening. So yeah, I, I, I love when the defense attorneys do a closing argument in the mini opening. It's a gift. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's look, it's come about and many openings have come about in the last whatever it is, five, seven years. I think Mike and I, we tried case together. We neither one of us did one. I I'm not that fond of them. And I've debated this a lot with other people, but like Mike says, I may do a mini opening on this case. And what I'm going to tell the jury is this is a mini opening and I'm not trying to convince you that my client should win the case. I'm going to tell you all the problems with my case right now so we can talk about them. I'm going to tell you my client has a prior injury and a prior accident. I'm going to tell you my client and one of them speaks Farsi. I want to use that to bring up a discussion that's going to get me cause and get all the haters. Don't try to win it in two minutes. You're yeah, trying to expose cause. Can't agree exactly. with that more. That's 100% exactly. correct. All right. Well, um, any final thoughts, guys? This has been phenomenal. I really learned a lot personally here. No? Uh, all right. Well, 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 well the, good. Chat, the, the BHBA put in the Resolve LA website. Um, it's a great program that we're, you know, all most of the, the trial lawyer organizations in LA have helped put together. Um, sign up. You can be a settlement officer if you're from the plaintiff or defense or you're a mediator. But this is really going to help get a lot of the backlog, you know, set aside so that we can actually get the cases that need to be tried in trial. So please sign up for that. It's in the chat. Um, we'll all put our uh, let's put our email addresses in the chat. If you have any questions, I'm sure we'd all be happy to help out, respond to Gary and Mike. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate you guys doing this. This is phenomenal. Hey. Thanks Happy for having me. I appreciate it. You guys it. are right in my hometown there. You're walking distance, the Beverly Hills Bar from my office. So happy to uh, be a part of it. Thank you very much.